If you've ever looked at the map of language families, you've probably noticed that almost the entirety of Europe speaks Indo-European. That is with the exception of Finland, Estonia and Hungary. Instead, they speak languages from the finno ugric branch of the larger Uralic family, made up of around 30 different languages stretching all the way to North Asia. But who are these finno ugric people and where did they come from? I am from one of these countries and even I was confused many years ago. Back then there was no clear answer and various vague theories competed against each other. In the myths of various finno ugric groups, their ancestry is often traced back to ancient rulers and warriors, like the Finnic Kaleva or Ostis and Ojes of the Komis. Meanwhile, their mythical homeland is remembered as a warm mountainous land in the south or east, a stark difference from the forests and plains they now inhabit. Archaeology and genetics have come a long way in the last decade, however, and many things have finally gained light. It turns out the finno ugric family is much younger than once thought, and those ancient legends that were not taken seriously before may not be far from truth. First, let's go back in time to 2500 BC, the Bronze Age. Indo-Europeans are expanding in all directions, but we find no trace of finno ugrians in these lands yet. Going further east, we have to make a stop by the Altai Mountains. Here lies the eastern end of the Indo-European expansion, the Afanasiev culture, the ancestors of Tokarians. They are the first pastoralists of East Asia, grazing sheep, cattle and horses. They are also familiar with bronze, using it for tools like knives and axes. 2200 BC. Major climate change sweeps through Eurasia. In the steppe there is a period of drought. While the pastoralist Indo-Europeans are struggling to feed their herds, a new group of people arrives on the Altai from the east to make use of this opportunity. Where exactly did they come from and why is not yet known. What's important is these people speak Proto-Uralic. They are more primitive compared to the Indo-Europeans. They are hunters and fishers, wielding jade and flint instead of metal. This, however, gives them an advantage. They are not affected by the drought. As they settle down among their new neighbors, they adapt quickly, learning to herd animals, ride horses and use plums, which they call waske. They take quite an interest in metallurgy, as here they come up with two revolutionary inventions in bronze making. See, previously the bronze used in the steppe was not actually bronze, but copper, hardened by changing the metal's arsenic level. But unlike the steppe, the Altai mountains have tin, which these people used to make true high-grade bronze. The second invention is lost wax casting. In this process a wax model is first carefully carved, after which a clay mold is built around it. The wax is then melted and the bronze poured in instead. After the bronze has cooled, the mold is removed, leaving the finished item. With this technique the craftsman has a lot more control over the shape of the cast item, allowing for more details and less polishing. These inventions give birth to an ancient Eurasian bronze trade network referred to as the Seima Drubino phenomenon. For a while scientists doubted its connection to the finno ugric people, but recent genetic studies confirmed the old suspicions of many archaeologists. It was this culture that spread the finno ugric languages and people across Europe and Asia. With this new technology, mass bronze production begins. But while things like tools and sculptures are also made, finno ugrians are not content with being simple craftsmen. Instead, the main focus is put into weapons. Spears with these iconic hooks for pulling enemies off their horses, socketed axes with geometric ornaments, daggers with animal-shaped pommels. Finnogrins were ready to begin their expansion. The strategy was simple. Trade with those who have something to offer and conquer those who don't. In the east, their wares reach into China and Korea, being adopted by various cultures. Eventually they are used by the Kuifang, people of the Devil's Country, to raid the lands of the Shang dynasty. In the west, following the forest steppe line, finno ugrians come across another Indo-European group, the Indo-Iranians. The drought has forced them to concentrate around rivers in the north and militarize in order to defend their lands, making them a formidable force. They ride horses and war chariots, they build large fortified cities and they know basic agriculture. In the southern Urals they are represented by the Sintashta culture, a copper-producing military powerhouse. Finnogrins build good relations with them and there is active trade between the two cultures. From them a decent portion of loan words enter the finno ugric languages. Agricultural and pastoral words such as porchas for pig, ketchre for spinning wheel and peime for milk. Across the Urals on the Volga and Kama rivers lie the Indo-Iranic Abashevo and Fatyanovo cultures. Unlike the Sintashta, these people don't have much to offer in terms of trade. A large-scale war breaks out between the Indo-Iranians and the finno ugric newcomers. 
The end of the Abasheva culture is characterized by mass graves of people killed by arrows with flint heads, the same ones used by the same Adrubino culture. By the end of the war of Inoglians come the rule the Volga and Kama rivers, killing or enslaving the previous Indo-European inhabitants. The self-name of the Indo-Iranians at this time is Arias, Aryan. This word too is borrowed into proto finno permic as Oria, meaning slave. We have to make a quick stop to talk about the nature of the same Adrubino phenomenon. The reason it's often not considered a proper culture is because for one, there are no ceramics associated with it and for two, we haven't found any of their settlements. The findings are limited to grave sites and weaponry. The reason behind this is that the Finnogrians driving this phenomenon were a small, nomadic group of warriors and merchants. As Finnogrians settled in different regions, they married the local women and adopted their ceramics and ways of life. This is also why Finnogrians have more white Indo-European ancestry the further west you go. Another reason why the phenomenon is hard to trace is because Finnogrians cremated their dead, making archaeological and genetic research difficult. The tradition of cremation lasted a while too. Finns and Estonians started burying their dead only in the 12th century with the coming of Christianity. That's not to say that the dead were forgotten. Memorial altars were built into the ground, decorated with weapons, bone armor, jade discs and other items. Their descendants would visit them regularly, honoring their ancestors by feasting and bringing offerings. This tradition too continued for a while. The Mari people do this day build altars for their ancient heroes where they conduct prayers and sacrificial feasts. Continuing where we left off, 1500 BC, the same Adrubino era is coming to a close. While most Indo-Iranians have moved south to begin their conquest of Iran and India, some Iranic nomads have stayed in the northern steppe, mixing with Finno-Ogrians as well as Turkic people further east. The Karasuk culture descended from same Adrubino is the result of such a mixture. They continue bronze production with Altai tin, trading it to China and the steppe. At this point, the Shang Dynasty too has adopted same Adrubino weapons, and with them, tin bronze and lost wax casting, kickstarting the Chinese Bronze Age. Among the Karasuk are the ancestors of Samoyedic people. Yes, those Samoyedic people. The first branch to split off from the Uralic family, at this time living in the Altai and Cyan mountains where some of their descendants would continue to live until modern times. Meanwhile, in the West, Finno-Ugrians have split into Ugrians and Finno-Permians, carrying a variety of cultures descended from the same Adurbino tradition. Ugrians inhabit the forest steppe east of the Urals. The Mainzi and Hanti people, as well as Hungarians, would later descend from them. West of the Urals, Finno-Permians mainly live around the Volga and Kama rivers. They are the ancestors of Finns, Estonians, Maris, Utmurts and a multitude of other groups. Within a few centuries, those hunter-fishers from Northeast Asia have become the producers and sellers of some of the highest quality bronze items in the world, inhabiting a large stretch of land from the Altai Mountains to Eastern Finland. Things have calmed down now after such a hectic era and Finnogrians have adapted to life in their new homeland, learning agriculture and slowly transitioning towards a sedentary lifestyle. Hunting and pastoralism remain as the primary ways of subsistence, however. This is also why finno ugrians have concentrated around the border between forest and steppe. Relations with their new Indo-European neighbors are still tense and raids and wars continue. Neither side manages to gain an advantage and the two groups remain at a deadlock for centuries. You might have also noticed that the Carpathian Basin and the Baltic are still inhabited by Indo-Europeans. That all changes when a new, different metal makes its way to the hands of finno ugrians bringing winds of change once again. Join me next time as we enter the Iron Age and follow the finno ugric people as they begin their second great expansion and start forming into the nations we know today. Thank you for watching and see you soon.